New research is changing everything we thought we knew about choline's impact on the cow and her calf, and top scientists have a lot to say about it. They are presenting new research that supports choline as a required nutrient to optimize milk production, choline as a required nutrient to support a healthy transition, choline as a required nutrient to improve calf health and growth, and choline as a required nutrient to increase colostrum quantity. This new research is solidifying choline's role as a required nutrient for essentially every cow, regardless of health status, milk production level, or body condition score. Learn more about the science that is changing the game and the choline source that is making it happen. Reassure Precision Release Choline from Balchem. Visit balchem.com slash scientists say to learn more. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Real Science Lecture Series. My name is Scott Sorrell, Director of Global Marketing at Balchem. Today, we welcome my good friend and dairy nutritionist extraordinaire, Dr. Clay Zimmerman. Dr. Zimmerman currently serves as a director of uh, the ANH, that's the Animal Nutrition and Health Technical Services team for uh, Balchem Corporation. Clay joined the team in 2013. In fact, this past Saturday was his 10-year anniversary. So happy anniversary, Clay. In his role, he also oversees all of Balchem's external animal research. Clay obtained his, bal his uh, bachelor's degree from Virginia Tech and his master's and PhD from North Carolina State University. He spent three decades now working as a dairy nutritionist around the globe, and he continues to live on the family farm in Maryland. Clay, uh, I, I feel like I should ask you what's in your glass tonight. Um, some of the folks attending today may not know that we uh, that you and I host a podcast called The Real Science Exchange, or should I call it a, a pubcast. And what we try to do there on the uh, pubcast is recreate the conversations and atmosphere that takes place in the pub after a scientific conference. And so I would uh, uh, invite you to, all, all you have to do is type in Real Science Exchange on any of your, uh, on the popular pi uh, platforms or on YouTube and, uh, and and check it out. Welcome, Clay. The floor is now yours. Thank you, Scott. It uh, yeah, it feels like you should sit, stay on the screen with me like we're, <laughs> like we're doing a Real Science Exchange here. Exactly, so. that'd be fun. We'll do it sometime. Yeah, it's quite quite a pleasure to be here today with with our audience uh, to present. Uh, not all rumor protective products are created equal, so we don't want this to be a commercial today. But thought it we thought it would be helpful to start off maybe just giving a little background about about Balchem and and our expertise in the in the area of micro encapsulation. So. Balchem Corporation, we're a publicly traded company. The, the company was founded in 1967. So, you know, we've been around for 56 years now. And we're basic in microencapsulation technology. My understanding is that uh, really almost from the start, uh, when the company was founded in 1967, we were a microencapsulating product. So we have many, many decades of expertise in this area. The company's broken up into three core business units. We have a human nutrition and health uh, business, an animal nutrition and health business um, that Scott and I are involved in, and especially products business. We also have a very large internal R&D group in the company. Um, we work across seven technology centers across uh, both the U.S. and Europe. Um, from an R&D standpoint. Um, so we, we have a lot of R&D resources um, that are committed to, um, to microencapsulation. And microencapsulates are heavily used in both our human nutrition and health businesses and our animal nutrition and health businesses. So the, the last time I asked this question a few years ago, uh, across, our, uh, across our company, portfolio, mainly that, you know, the human nutrition and health businesses and animal nutrition and health businesses, we, we sell over 200 different encapsulated products. So it's, it's uh, micro encapsulations very heavily used uh, within the company. 
So, you know, as far as application of encapsulates in our human nutrition and health business, you can see some different examples here. Um, and, and uses for encapsulation in our human businesses would be, uh, you know, first of all, to help control release and maintain the functionality of ingredients in products. It can also help improve stability and handling characteristics and, in, and increase viable shelf life. So you can see there are some di there are different applications of microencapsulates in the bakery businesses, um, meat businesses, and confectionery businesses. So there, there are lots of different applications um, for microencapsulates in our human businesses, as well as certainly some nutrient protection technology as well uh, for human applications. As far as our animal nutrition and health business, uh, we do we do pr produce some microencapsulates for the monogastric species. We started a um, a pet sure business. Uh, that business started, I believe, about seven years ago, and there are some different uh, encapsulated products used there. Um, they, we have pet sure pH control systems that are utilized in the pet food industry. Pet sure porosity and texture, and pet sure structure and forming, um, which which all utilize uh, encapsulates um, in in the monogastric species, and um, we do some encapsulation also um, in in Europe, uh, encapsulating tannins there. The focus of the presentation today is uh, microencapsulates for ruminants, so. Uh, our products there, our primary products for ruminants would be uh, Reassure. That's our flagship product. That was our first foray as a company into the um, into the animal space in the late 1990s. So Reassure Pre Precision Release Choline. We have a newer version of Reassure called Reassure XC that we um, that we use in Europe currently. Uh, Niasure is encapsulated niacin. Uh, Aminosure XM is encapsulated methionine. Uh, Aminosure L is encapsulated lysine. And the, and the last product would be nitrosure. That's encapsulated urea. Um, nitrosure acts a little differently than the other products. And I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later as far as uh, products in the ruminant portfolio. So encapsulation technology, th this is a quote from a, a, an article that appeared in, in Feedstuffs in 2011. Not all encapsulated products are created equally. Consequently, there are vast differences in their eff efficacy and stability. And that's certainly true. And that's, that's really you know, what uh, the focus of the presentation today is is to highlight some of these differences and what, what can lead to differences in encapsulates. So encapsulation, it's a, it's a very generic term. Huge differences can exist between products that protect the same compound even. What causes the variation in encapsulation performance? Um, so there are a number of factors here. One certainly is the starting form and mode of inclusion of the active ingredients. The coating technology can vary and manufacturing processes can vary. So again, microencapsulation, it's, it, it's one of our core businesses is protection technology. Um, and, and it's shown here in, in, this, in this diagram. Essentially, um, when we're microencapsulating, we're taking a substance or substances and we are protecting it, in our case, in layers of lipids uh, with our microencapsulation. This is just a, um, a picture under the microscope of an encapsulate. This is a cross section here. So you can see the active compound in the middle and the lipid coating on the outside of the product. So encapsulates can vary in a number of different ways. Um, they certainly can vary in design of the product. 
in the technology that's being used to do the encapsulation, and they certainly can vary in performance. Um, so there really are a couple of different things that we look at from a performance stamp standpoint in, uh, in ruminant encapsulates. One is stability in feed mixing and in a total mixed ration. How well, how well do these encapsulates withstand um, uh, mixing and sitting in a total mixed ration? And ultimately, it's animal performance that matters with the product. How does the product actually perform on the farm? So getting a little more granular, um, what are some of the difference, differences in encapsulates? So first of all, it could be both starting form of the active compound and the inclusion rate of the nutrient. So uh, for example, if we look at room protected methionine products, there are products on the market that will vary anywhere from 15% uh, DL methionine up to 80, 85% DL methionine. So, so the, the activity rate of encapsulates can vary greatly. That, that's true across you know, all of these different uh, compounds utilized in ruminants. The coating systems utilized can vary uh, dramatically. The composition of the coatings utilized can vary greatly. Um, and the manufacturing processes themselves can vary. So there are a multitude of factors that can lead to these differences in encapsulated products. If you look at encapsulates across the different industries that are out there, uh, they, these encapsulates can come in all different shapes and sizes. There are a lot of different types of encapsulation that are used across industries, and they will lead to very different product characteristics. In general, when we're looking at agricultural applications, the, uh, the two primary types of technology that are utilized with encapsulation are the true, what we'd call true single or multiple coatings. Uh, so these first two examples here, or what we would call a matrix particle, which is shown here. So this is just a picture. This is just, uh, you know, Different uh, different products that are on the market. These aren't all Balchem products that are that are in this picture, but you can see they do. They literally do come in all shapes and sizes, and and vary across you know across the spectrum here. And this can lead to very different performance, both in the feed and in the animal. So when it comes to lipid encapsulation, um, so the, the, the Balchem encapsulates are, are, are lipid encapsulates. Uh, these are the two primary types of encapsulation that are, that are utilized in the industry. So the, the, um, this, this diagram on the left is showing a matrix encapsulation. Another term that's sometimes used for this would be spray cooled and spray cooled or spray chilled encapsulates. And um, the analogy that we use there would be chocolate chip cookie dough. So if we were if we were encapsulating choline chloride, for instance, in a matrix encapsulation, essentially what we would do is we would we would mix choline chloride with our lipids that we're using to encapsulate and we would form particles from that that would look like this um, with a matrix encapsulation there's always some some of the active compound at the surface just the way it, the way it's mixed uh, in general you know when it comes to ruminant uh, applications a a matrix encapsulate will have reduced um, ruminal protection and stability. And uh, we'll show you some examples of that a little bit later. The, uh, the diagram on the right is showing a true encapsulate. Um, so these are also known either as single layer coatings or multi-layer coatings. The example we would use here would be an M&M, where essentially we're, 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 we're forming a core that we are protecting 
in either single or multiple layers of lipids uh, that are fully encapsulating the product. So in general, with a true end cap, there's no compound at the surface of the product. It's con completely enveloped in, um, in, in layers of lipid coating in this case, which result in higher ruminal protection and stability in general. So for ruminant applications, true encapsulates are, would be the preferred uh, application uh, for, for, mo for most ruminant applications. So this is a time-lapse um, photograph that, that compares um, a, true, a true encapsulate on the top versus a matrix encapsulate. So these are two rumen-protected lysine products. The flask on the left is the true encapsulate, and this is just sitting in room temperature water. So you can imagine what would happen in the room and would be more severe than this. But this is this is just showing you, you know, through through time lapse pictures, what happens with a true end cap on the left and a matrix end cap on the right. So you can see at time zero, as soon as they're put into water, the products look different in the flask. After 30 minutes sitting in the water, you can see the product on the right is starting, the water starting to take on some color. That color is from the release of lysine hydrochloride into the water. At two hours, you can see even more color and more difference in the product on the right. And after four hours, there is quite a bit of color and release of the lysine hydrochloride into the water. So this is a very simple test, just, just to show what, what happens with some of these products just sitting in water. Again, what's happening in the room and would, would, be, would be even uh, greater release than this. Another um, characteristic that some, some uh, encapsulates have would be freeze-thaw stability. Because of all of the human food applications that we have as a company, all of our products are freeze-thaw stable. So these are actually two examples here on the screen. These are products that are not freeze-thaw stable. So you can see these products are both encapsulated. These are under the microscope. So the product on the left and product on the right, you can see they appear to be intact. Uh, before freezing. After freezing, you can see how these cracks or fissures start to form in these products, and that, that's compromising the uh, efficacy of the product at that point. So if we were to test these products for ruminal protection, um, so the product, uh, this first product is a freeze-thaw stable product. So this product uh, before freezing is 90% rumen stable at eight hours. After freezing, it's still 90% uh, rumen stable. The product on the right is not freeze-thaw stable. So the, this product before freezing is 80% rumen stable. After freezing, it's less than 40% rumen stable. So it's, it's lo losing over half of its rumen stability uh, after it goes through a freeze-thaw cycle in that case. So you're, you will lose product efficacy in that case. This is just a picture of a, of, of a, a um, freeze-thaw stable product on the left versus one on the right. Uh, this is our encapsulated urea product, NitroSure, on the left. This is under a microscope, and there's dye applied to this. There's a yellow dye. You can see the NitroSure, none of the dye is absorbed by the product. This product on the right is not freeze is not freeze thaw stable. You can see the fissures in the product on the right when it's subjected to dye under the microscope. The dye starts to uh, starts to go into the end cap, so that 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 product's compromised um, because of the cracks in the encapsulate. So why do we encapsulate nutrients for ruminants? So in general, it's, it's for targeted delivery within the gastrointestinal tract of the animal. 
And rumen fermentation often results in massive breakdown of most of these important compounds. So choline, uh, choline is very extensively degraded in the rumen by the rumen microbes. It's 98% plus rumen degraded. Uh, niacin is 94% rumen degraded, and the and, and amino acids are very extensively degraded as well. Most of them 90 plus percent degraded in the rumen. So many of these nutrients need to be protected from ruminal de degradation for effective absorption by the cow post-ruminally. So this was some classic research. This was done in Rich Ehrman's lab at the University of Maryland. This was published in the, in, in the late uh, 1980s. And what, he, what they did here was this, uh, this control diet had 24 grams per cow per day of choline chloride intake. Uh, so they measured uh, intake of choline chloride and how much was showing up at the duodenum. So 24 grams of a choline chloride intake, 1.2 grams appear at the duodenum. They, they increased this to 178 grams of choline chloride intake, and essentially no more of this showed up at the duodenum. It, it was extensively degraded in the rumen. They added an extra 300 grams of choline chloride to the diet, and only one more gram of that appeared at the duodenum. So just uh, proof that choline chloride is almost completely degraded in the rumen and, and, and ne needs to be encapsulated uh, to, to perform in, in a ruminant. Uh, <clears throat> this diagram shows the, the characteristics that are needed in a, in a quality rumen protected product. So this is, this is basically the, um, the steps that we go through when we're either developing brand new rumen protected products or we're improving existing products. Um, the, the one exception to this is nitrous. Or we have an encapsulated urea product. We want that product to release in the rumen just gradually over time. But when we're protecting nutrients such as choline chloride, methionine, lysine, niacin, et cetera. We're trying to protect them as much as we can from ruminal degradation. And we, we want post-ruminal absorption. So the first characteristic we look at is rumen stability. So <clears throat> we, want, uh, we want as good of a ruminal stability as we can get. Uh, if we have extensive ruminal stability with a product, we sort of lose the game from the start. So we're trying to get as much product past the room as possible intact. Second, the second part we look at is intestinal release. So, and it's a balance between intestinal release and rumen stability. So we want good ruminal stability, but as much intestinal release as possible from the product. Once we uh, develop prototypes that have good ruminal stability and good intestinal release, the next step we go through is feed and mixing stability. So we go through a protocol of feed mixing that we'll discuss a little bit later, as well as TMR stability. If a product is, uh, that we're developing is not feed and mix stable, we go back to the drawing board and work on prototypes that are feed and mix stable. And then ultimately, we, we want to be able to show a biological response in the cow. Uh, we do. We, we want to do the research to prove that the product actually works on the farm in your situations. If any of the, if any of these functions are compromised, the product may fail to deliver as expected as expected on the farm. So that there are many different types of testing that can be used for evaluating encapsulated products. Uh, the first ones are in vitro techniques. So these would be different lab techniques that can be utilized uh, to evaluate encapsulated products. The second one would be in situ techniques in the animal. So looking at ruminal stability. And then finally in vivo or uh, experiments that are done in the animal to show efficacy actually in the animal 
So let's talk first about ruminal stability. So I want to talk a little bit about in vitro techniques here. So this is, there are many different in vitro techniques that are utilized, uh, certainly globally to, to look at, uh, at different products as well as different encapsulates that are out there. The, the uh, procedure that I'm going to show data from here is a product or a procedure called the multi-step protein evaluation or the MSPE method. This was an in vitro method that was developed in Mike Van, uh, Dr. Mike Van Amberg's lab at Cornell University. So all of these MSPE slides I'm going to show you are utilizing their technique that this was published back in, in 2013. Um, and the testing that was done here was done at Cumberland Valley Analytical Services. So this is just showing some different rumor protected lysine products as far as ruminal degradability. And you can see these products with this technique, they varied in ruminal degradability anywhere from 13% up to 29% um, using utilizing this in vitro technique. This is, uh, these are some different rumor protected lysine products, but this is utilizing in situ techniques. So ruminal release actually in situ in animals. This, this study was actually published in 2016 in the Journal of Dairy Science. And you can see these products vary greatly in in situ release. So there, there, were, there was a product here that at six hours, only had about an 11% uh, in situ release, whereas another one had over 90% release. And they measured release out through 12 hours in situ. So much greater differences showing here with uh, when we look at actual in situ releases in the cow. Uh, this is the MSPE technique looking at some different rumor protected choline sources that are available. There's tremendous variation in ruminal, degrad in ruminal degradability of these products. So here's a product that with 11% ruminal degradability with that technique. And there actually are products that are 100% ruminal release with this product. So a product like this, you would question why it is even encapsulated with 100% ruminal release. And then this is in situ data from different encapsulated choline products that are there. It actually looks, the in situ data actually looks very similar to the MSPE data on these products. So this is showing actually ruminal stability here. So here are a few products. Here's a product that at eight hours only has 11%. Uh, ruminal release, it's 89% stable at eight hours. Here's another product that's essentially 100% released at eight, at eight hours in situ. So again, we there's a widespread in ruminal stability in situ with, rumen, with these uh, encapsulated choline products that are on the market. And again, I just want to remind you again, I showed this slide earlier, uh, just the water release again, a true end cap versus a matrix end cap on the right. Uh, so these, these room temperature water tests, they can, they can actually be an effective means of showing what I would call a very poor quality uh, encapsulate from, from a, from a um, ruminal stability standpoint. The, se the second characteristic we're looking for, again, is intestinal release or bioavailability. So again, utilizing this MSPE technique, um, we can look at, at ruminal uh, or intestinal digestibility here. So to orient you to these graphs, I'm going to show a few of these. This dark blue uh, rectangle at the bottom. This is showing the rumen degradable, the rumen degradability of these different products. These are rumen protected methionine products. So the ruminal degradability again varies anywhere from about 7% to about 15% utilizing this MSPE technique uh, across these products. This light blue 
rectangle at the top, this will be um, total tract undigested nitrogen. So this is actually bypassing, in theory, bypassing uh, uh, digestion in, in the cow would appear in the feces. This gray box is what we want to focus on. This will be the intestinally digestible nitrogen. And you can see there's quite a variation in products here. So there's a few products here that are about 80% uh, intestinally digestible by this technique. And one here that's only 3% has very poor intestinal digestibility utilizing this in vitro technique. If we were to look at room of protected lysine products, um, the intestinally digestible nitrogen varies anywhere from um, a high of 76% down to 42% utilizing this technique. So now we're going to move into some in vivo techniques of bioavailability. And I'm going to focus on amino acids here. So um, this first technique is, uh, so this is for uh, amino chorale, room of protected lysine product here. This, this is some work that was uh, presented back in 2009. This is utilizing a, uh, a plasma bioavailability technique. And um, looking at different avamasal doses of lysine hydrochloride infused into these cows and then feeding this product to calculate a bioavailability looking at plasma measurements of lysine. Utilizing this technique, um, this product had a 62% uh, bio lysine bioavailability utilizing this technique. Uh, we tend not to utilize this technique much anymore uh, with our products. There's a lot of variability of animal to animal variability variability in this technique. Um, we've looked at products that within an individual product. We'll show bioavailability is anywhere from a zero bioavailability up to 60 to 70 percent bioavailability. The same product in different cows. So there's a lot of we have seen a lot of um, cow to cow variability variability in this technique. So there are some other techniques that have been developed that are utilized to look at uh, at in vivo meth. Um, nutrient bioavailabilities. This, this particular technique is a selenomethionine, sel, selenomethionine technique. It's an in vivo method. The products are actually fed to the cows. And essentially uh, what you're doing with this technique is you're feeding, a selenium, you're feeding selenium yeast to the cow in the diet at a, um, at a uh, constant dose, and that serves as a tracer of methionine in the milk. Uh, this is a published technique. It was published back in 2009 in the Journal of Dairy Science uh, by uh, Bill Weiss and Norm St. Pierre out of Ohio State University. Uh, we really like this technique. Uh, unfortunately, it only works for methionine. It's, it's specific to methionine, but essentially you can test the bioavailability of a room protected methionine product by utilizing this technique. You're measuring how much methionine from those products appears in the milk protein of the cow. Um, these, these just show the results of one of these trials. This is comparing Amino Sure XM to a, uh, another product in the market. Essentially what this is saying is these two products are equal in methionine bioavailability with this technique. And if we double the dose of the product, twice as much is showing up um, in, in the milk protein as would be expected. There's another technique that's being utilized. Uh, this, the, there's some different stable isotope techniques that are utilized there. This is a technique that uh, has been published out of uh, Mark Hannigan's lab at Virginia Tech, um, really looking at uh, at plasma appearance and bioavailability. This this technique can be utilized essentially for any nutrient fed amino acids, potentially choline, any other nutrient. 
And uh, utilizing this technique, uh, this particular product had a 55% uh, methionine bioavailability. Um, so utilizing two different in vivo methodologies, the milk selenomethionine technique and the stable isotope technique, um, we get equal methionine bioavailabilities here. So this slide's really just to show you how, you know, how these numbers get used then uh, in the animal nutrition models then. So this particular product is 70% methionine. Again, the, these products can vary greatly in methionine content. Uh, th this one happens to be 70%. It's 80% rumen bypass, 68% intestinal uh, availability. So the methionine bioavailability is 54 and a quarter percent. That's simply your rumen bypass time to intestinal availability is methionine bioavailability. The number that matters in the end as a user is metabolizable methionine. And that's simply the, the uh, nutrient payload, the 70% times methionine bioavailability. 70% times 54 and a quarter percent methionine bioavailability is 38% metabolizable methionine. So if you fed 10 grams of this product to a cow, you would expect metabolizable methionine to go up by 3.8 grams in that diet. The next thing we look at is feed and mixing stability. Um, we utilize um, mixer studies to do this. So this just uh, this talks a little bit about the technique technique that we use internally. We do this on a small scale. We mix uh, 100 pound or 45 kilo batches of different products. We've used this across a variety of different encapsulated products to look at at mixed stability in a mineral mix. Um, in our mineral, we use sodium bicarbonate, limestone, magnesium oxide, and a little bit of soybean oil for dust control because the mineral can be quite dusty. And the recipe would, uh, that we use is anywhere from 90 to 98% mineral mix and two to 10% of the end caps, depending on inclusion rate of these encapsulates. And we mix these products for three minutes. This would be the most, really the most severe thing you can do from a feed mixing standpoint would be to mix these with a mineral mix. Uh, this is a picture of the lab scale mixer that we use. It's a, it's a ribbon paddle mixer. This is a picture with the, uh, with a batch loaded in there. So we've got the mineral on the bottom. This is an encapsulate on the top. This is not a biochem encapsulate on top here. This would be a competitive product. So this, this is what it looks like as we load the mixer and then after we've mixed the product. And these are the results of mixed stability. Uh, this is with some different RP choline products. So again, this is showing stability in, in this graph. So this the products here in red, so the solid line is the unmixed product. So what was stability prior to mixing? And then what was stability after it's mixed in the mineral? So this product, this is Reassure in this case, very stable both before mixing and after mixing in a mineral mix. The blue product here, uh, this would be a competitive product. It's not very room and stable prior to mixing and the mixing didn't really damage it anymore. This product in the gray was about 70% or about 30% rumen stable uh, prior to mixing. After mixing uh, in a mineral mix, it actually lost about 20 percentage units uh, in rumen stability. So th that product was damaged by mineral mixing at three minutes in a mineral mix. So, th so there are differences there as well. Um, this is some tests and we've done with Reassure, just, you know, mixing times. Our recommendation is to keep mixing times to four minutes or less in a mineral mix if we want optimal product performance. Um, so our general recommend, mixing recommendations for encapsulated products, 
And this will really be true of all encapsulates. We recommend uh, mineral mixing times of four minutes or less to minimize excessive mi mixing and unnecessary abrasion that can occur. We also recommend encapsulating, uh, adding encapsulate products as late into the mixing process as possible uh, to minimize the total mixing time of the uh, encapsulates in that mix. If you have at least 50% non-mineral ingredients in the formula, it greatly reduces potential abrasion of encapsulated nutrients. And keep encapsulated products dry in sealed bags. A lot of these products are hygroscopic. So we recommend storing encapsulated products below 120 degrees Fahrenheit or 50 degrees Celsius. Uh, recommended store, storage temperatures for end caps are 50 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 to 32 degrees Celsius. Finally, we want to look at TMR stability. So there was a, pa the, a paper published. I referenced this one in an earlier slide. This was published in the Journal of Dairy Science back in 2016. This work was done at the, at the Minor Institute in New York State. They were looking at uh, basically all of the different commercial room of protected lysine products that were on the market at the time. This work was actually done over 10 years ago, but it was, it was published in 2016. I will tell you some of these products are not available commercially in the market anymore. And they, they measured TMR stability at two different dry matter levels of the TMR. So the solid lines in this graph, they were with the lower dry matter TMR, essentially 40% dry matter, 60% moisture in the TMR. The dashed lines were the higher dry matter TMR, uh, about 52% dry matter or 48% moisture. And you can see there's a lot of variation in, um, in TMR stability. So what Essentially, what they did was they mixed these products into the TMRs of the two different dry matter contents, and they, they let them sit anywhere from 0 to 24 hours. So 0, 6, 18, and 24 hours sitting in a TMR. All they're doing is measuring how much of the lysine was released from the product into the TMR. So the, the product's losing lysine to the TMR. That they're not measuring ruminal stability. They're just measuring how much lysine was lost to the TMR, um, which means it, it would degrade in the rumen. So if we were to look at six hours, for instance, so this is if you were feeding a TMR four times a day, these products varied anywhere from essentially no release in the TMR to about 60%. 24 hour time point that would if you're, these cows are being fed once a day again some of these products had essentially no release to the tmr and others were um were over 50 percent release so pretty big differences in tmr stability of these rumor protected lysine products this is some work that we've done utilizing a similar technique looking at different rumor protected choline products that are on the market. So this is looking at stability in this case. Um, so this is looking at 0, 6, 12, and 24 hour time points. So cows that would be fed either four, two, or one time a day and looking at TMR stability. So how much of the choline in these products is just being lost to the TMR sitting in it? So you can see two of these products have, have very good TMR stability. Um, essentially, you know, almost no loss in this top product. That'd be our Reassure XC product. This is Reassure, is losing very little to the TMR. Some of these products are losing almost all of their choline payload to the TMR just sitting there. Uh, so these products are losing 70% plus at six hours. Uh, over 80% and essentially 100% by 24 hours. So some pretty major differences in TMR stability. And then ultimately, we want to measure biological responses in the cow. So we'll finish up with a few slides here. 
So room and protected lysines, this was some of our original amino sure L research that was presented back in 2009. So when we fed either 30 or 60 grams per cow per day of amino sure L, compared it to a control diet that would have been lysine deficient, we saw very nice milk production responses here. So, so increases in dry matter intake and, um, and, and five pound increases in milk yield in this case. So demonstrating the, the product actually works in the animal with increased dry matter intake and milk yield. This is some work with rumen protective methionine, looking at a couple different rumen protective methionine products here versus a control diet. And we saw the expected response here. We saw an increase in milk protein percentage, significant increase versus a control diet with both of these rumen protective methionine products. That would be a typical response that we would expect to see. Increased milk protein percent and ultimately increased milk protein yield with rumen protective methionine. And of course, there's a lot of published research out there on the benefits of Reassure, our rumen protected choline product in, uh, in transition cows. And the benefits really carry through after, even after supplementation of the product during the transition period. This uh, first study was published back in 2018 in the Journal of Dairy Science. These, these cows that were fed Reassure three weeks prepartum or three weeks postpartum exhibited a 4.6 pound uh, increased milk yield actually throughout lactation through 40, through 40 weeks of lactation. This is a second study out of the University of Fo Florida published in 2020 showing, and this was through 15 weeks of lactation. Again, the products only fed three weeks prior to calving it to three weeks post calving. And there was over a five pound energy corrective milk response out through 15 weeks of lactation. And some more recent research uh, out of uh, Barry Bradford's lab at Michigan State University showing uh, uh, seven pound milk responses through 12 weeks of lactation when Reassure was supplemented three weeks, again, three weeks prior to calving to three weeks post calving. And this is just showing um, from, uh, this was from the Arshad meta-analysis on rumen protected choline products. This was published in Journal of Dairy Science back in 2020, just showing the consistent responses to, um, to supplemental rumen protected choline during the transition period. And, and two newer studies in higher producing cows. This is the Michigan State work I was just showing. Um, and work out of Heather White's lab at the University of Wisconsin that was published this year as well. So we continue to see these, these um, consistent milk responses in, uh, in cows that transition cows that are supplemented with rumen protected choline, even at very high production levels. So to summarize, we'll wrap up here. There are many differences in encapsulated products for dairy cows, and the differences are due to design of products. There, there are differences now. These products are designed. There are different types of coatings, amount and composition of coatings. I can tell you that all of our rumen and all of our rumen encapsulated products, they vary in uh, they vary in um, amount and composition of the coatings. It all depends on what we're trying to accomplish with that nutrient in the cow and where, uh, where we're trying to deliver product to the cow. Uh, there are manufacturing differences that account, uh, will account for differences. They differ in nutrient content again. Uh, again, I'll go back to the methionine example where, you know, methionine content can vary anywhere from 15 to 85 percent in these products. Uh, bioavailability certainly differs between products, and you can see there are differences in feed stability as well. Uh, true encapsulates or the multi-layered coating coated products are preferred for ruminant applications due to their higher uh, levels of ruminant and feed stability. 
And there are four really important features of a good ruminant encapsulate. Uh, good ruminal stability, good nutrient bioavailability, feed and TMR stability, and ultimately biological performance. We want these uh, products to perform on farm in your cows. Thank you. All right, Clay. Thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, before we get started answering your questions, we'd like to share a brief video. Then we'll be right back to answer the questions submitted during today's presentation. Delivering the perfect ration for the rumen microbes might be more important and more challenging than feeding the cow. Nitrisure, Precision Release Nitrogen, delivers a consistent supply of rumen-protected nitrogen to improve animal performance, maximize profitability, and minimize nitrogen excretion into the environment. With Nitrisure, you get improved fiber digestion, increased microbial protein production, and reduced dependence on expensive protein sources with a high carbon footprint. Feed the microbes that feed your cows with Nitrisure Precision Release Nitrogen from Balchem. Visit balchem.com to learn more. All right, as a reminder, you can still submit questions through the Q&A tab at the top of your screen. Uh, Clay, first question comes in uh, from David. He's, uh, he's commenting that he also likes uh, the MSPE assay, but he's wondering if there are any others that you would recommend. <laughs> it's a great question. So ultimately, it's, it's, it's the performance in the animal that matters, right? Um, there are certainly benefits to in vitro techniques. It's very important in the product development process, right, to help speed that up. So we utilize in vitro techniques as a screening tool um, on the front end during, you know, during um, product development. Uh, we certainly can't take the time to do all of the animal testing that would be required during a product development process. It would take many, many years to actually run all these products through animals. So um, the MSPE, it, certainly here in the U.S. is the one that, that we prefer. There are a lot of other techniques that are out there. Um, we've done work with different techniques. Um, none of them, <clears throat> what I will tell you is there still is work lacking, really aligning these in vitro techniques to what is happening in animals, especially across all these different actives that are out there with encapsulates. So, you know, when it, when it comes to these encapsulated products, again, you know, they vary a lot in technology and the actives um, change, right? Are we talking about methionine, lysine, choline, you know, or other things? So I would say there still is a, there still is work to be done really correlating actual performance in vivo in the animal to these different in vitro techniques that are out there. Um, it's easier to do from the rumen stability standpoint, but, but ultimately when you're looking at, you know, bioavailability, I think there's still work to be done there. So it's a great question. Yeah, Clay, we, we've seen people use the uh, in vitro assays to kind of claim uh, that's the bioavailability of their product. And so I know you kind of answered that question already, but maybe could you kind of pointedly answer that? Is that, is, is that a, the appropriate way to measure bioavailability and, and how reliable are those numbers? I would, I'd say again, it's a starting point. It's, it's, it's missing, it's missing some of the steps, right? These in vitro techniques, they're not taking feed mixing and feed stability into account, right? So, you know, you want to, to know how a product's really going to perform on the farm. You have to go through the whole process. These encapsulates have to withstand mixing in the feed mill. Think about all the steps that an encapsulate will go through being mixed in feed, being conveyed, going into feed bins, going into a bulk truck being delivered to a farm and going into a TMR mixer. 
So there are a lot of steps between, um, you know, start that starting end cap and ultimately the cow consuming it. So that's, you know, that that's one point that certainly gets missed with in vitro techniques that you can replicate in animal studies is putting them, putting them through, you know, all the rigors that they need to withstand on the farm. Yeah, thanks, Clay. Uh, Usama's asking, he's kind of curious as to uh, what we're using in our coding. And I'm, you know, without giving away anything proprietary, is there some things that you can talk about in general uh, to kind of reflect kind of some of the complexities <laughs> in, in developing <laughs> coatings for various uh, nutrients? It's a, it's a really good question. I'm, I'm going to not answer it directly. What I will tell you is, you know, within the industry, there are, I'll tell you, first of all, this is not an easy process. You know, we, we've been at this for 56 years, um, build, building encapsulates for lots of applications. Um, we've actually been working in the animal space for about 30 years. I actually just found that out last week. I, knew, I know, I know, we've been in the, we've been selling in the, in the, um, in the room in it space for for 25 years now um but it it's a very complex process there is a lot there's a lot of science to developing uh a good encapsulate and there's a lot of art as well there are lots of variables lots of variables to take into account that's actually vary across all you know all these different uh substances that are out there so our coatings, they're all lipid based, but, but the composition varies uh, dramatically. And it's not any single, it's not any single coating that's out there. They, they vary by product and they're pretty complex in how they're built. All right. Thanks, Clay. Uh, Eric's got a very interesting question. He says in the in, uh, in vitro screening steps, how important is the type of diet of the rumen fluid donor cows? Wow, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know how much it varies with end caps. It certainly would vary a lot, uh, depending on what types of products you're you're you are trying to evaluate. Um, when we're doing it, um, I, I would say you do have to be careful about that if you're utilizing different labs <clears throat> to run in situ. What when we run in situs, we utilize one lab where they feed a consistent diet so that uh, to eliminate that as a variable. But uh, I'm sure that does make, that can make a difference if they're on a really high forage diet or a, you know, higher grain diet, for instance. I'm sure, I'm sure that, that, that could make some differences there because obviously you're, you, you could be altering uh, the microflora, the microbiota that are in the rumen. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Paul's asking, why do some products vary so much in results from in vitro testing versus the in vivo animal test? I wish I knew the answer to that. Exactly. Um, and I, I think it varies. Um, I think it varies by, you know, the compound that we're talking about. So there, there are certain there are certain encapsulation technologies that look pretty similar in vitro to in vivo, um, depending on you know steps that are included there. So, you know any any in vitro technique, you know we're doing the best we can to try to mimic in vivo conditions. I think it's a challenge across all of these different technologies that are out there and the different coatings to find one, one in vitro technique that really works across such a vast array of products that are out there. So I think that's one reason why, why we see, we see these differences. We're not, we're not able to <laughs> adequately mimic all the conditions that are happening in vivo in the in vitro circumstances. I mean, there are big differences as you saw big differences just in ruminal stability between some of the in vitro techniques and what happened, what actually happens in the cow. And, 
it um, it it, se- it seems to vary some by the nutrient, right? If if we looked at lysine, there were huge differences there between uh, in vitro and in vivo. Choline looked more similar bet- between the techniques, at least from the ruminal step. Yeah. Larry's got an interesting question. I'm going to be interested to see how you answer this one, but how long does it take to develop a new encapsulated product? That's an excellent question. Uh, a long time. Uh, because, right, th- th- think about think about the four steps we talked about, right? So we're working on working on ruminal stability and intestinal release. And we can, you know, we can certainly we test that initially through through in vitro techniques. We have to do it as a screening tool. Then we go into, you know, the feed, uh, the feed mixing and TMR mixing stability. So all of that takes time. And then ultimately, we're not putting a product into the market without doing the animal testing. Um, so, you know, looking at doing production studies and bioavailability studies on, on the products and that, that can take years. So honestly, I would say a fast one, a, a, a getting a product to market quick would probably, it's probably at least a two to three year process. We've had products we've been working on for 12 years. <laughs> we just, some are hard to master. Uh, to get the product right, you know, to get a good product into the market. It takes, it can take a really long time to go through all of these steps. Yep. Great answer, Clay. Uh, finally, uh, we're past the top of the hour, so I've got time for one more question. Uh, Sarah's asking, uh, why do the, the active nutrient content levels vary so much in encapsulated products? So, so- Another really good question. Some of it has to do with the technology that's being used. So if you think about the diagram I was showing, you know, the matrix encapsulate versus a true encapsulate. So the physics of creating a matrix encapsulate, you can only load so much active in there, right? So I, in general, with a, with a matrix encapsulate, D- depends on what your starting material is, you know, whether it's methionine or choline or, or lysine. So methionine is straight D-L-methionine. Choline is choline chloride, so it's not straight choline ion. And lysine is typically lysine hydrochloride. It's not straight lysine. It's, a, you know, it's a lysine salt. So your matrix end caps in general, you have to have a certain amount of of lipid in the matrix. So in general, they have, they have less loading of the nutrient. It's pretty difficult to get much more than a 50% nutrient loading into, into that, that type of product. Whereas a true end cap, you can vary the amount of coding, right? You're creating a core, a material that you're encapsulating and you could put a very thin core on it. So nitrosure is a good example of that. Nitrosure, we actually want to degrade in the room and we're not trying to bypass the room with nitrosure. It has a thin coating on it. It's only 11% coating on that product. It's 89% urea in that case. Uh, so you can get a really high nutrient payload in that because of what you're trying to do with it and the fact that it's a true encapsulate. So you can vary the amount of coating. Some also, you know, some of these products may be a combination of active ingredients. Like maybe there's both methionine and lysine in a product, right? So you're not going to have as high of a loading, uh, nutrient load if it's a, a combination product. But it has to do with design and ultimately what will work in, in the animal. Great answer, Clay. And with that, we're going to... Uh... Uh, put a bow on this one. So I want to thank you. I want to thank everybody for t- attending today's webinar. If you have additional questions, please submit them to anh.marketing at balchem.com. The Real Science Lecture Series of Webinars continues on February 6th with Breaking Barriers, Exploring Dietary Factors Influencing Gut Function for Cattle. And that's going to be presented by Dr. Greg Penner from the University of Saskatchewan. 
Visit Balkim.com slash real science for more details and to register for all future webinars. Balkim's podcast series continues to offer a deeper dive into our webinar topics. Log on to your favorite podcast platform and search for The Real Science Exchange or visit Balkim.com slash podcast. If you want a really cool Real Science Exchange t-shirt, just subscribe to the Real Science Exchange. Send us a screenshot along with your address and shirt size to anh.marketing at balchem.com, and we'll get that off to you right away. On behalf of your friends here at Balchem, thank you for joining us today.